What makes you, you? Think about that for a second. What makes you, you and not somebody else? What would those closest to you, if you asked them, what makes me, me, and not, you know, my brother-in-law or uh, my boss or my ex, what makes me, me? What would they say about what makes you, you? In this series, Shaped for Significance, I want to help position you for exactly that, significance. No one says, I want to live a life that doesn't matter. We all want to matter. Our own glory, our own honor, our own success is too small of a thing to live for. We want to live for someone else's glory, for something bigger than just ourselves. And I think that we can be easily on the cusp of something big and major in people's lives. I am pumped about how many people have, have started attending, have returned and, and attended again multiple times, and now are getting committed into ministry through on ramp, and even today coming to the new people party. What would it take for you to walk into a church you've never been in before? Yes, I've had a Red Bull this morning. Walk into a church you've never attended before, to return to that church you've never attended before, to keep returning, and then go to a luncheon that they said is free. What would it take for, that, for, for God to do that in you? That's what's happening, and I'm thankful for that. But to see that go forward, it's going to take all of us. And when I say all of us, I mean all of us. Everybody say all. all. It's also going to take each one of us. You understand the difference? It's going to take all of us from head to toe. It's going to take each one of us from age 5 to 95. Do we have anybody 95? I don't think so. we got some getting close, though, but I won't call them out. So the series is built on a simple acronym, Spiritual Gifts. If you're following along your notes, I would encourage you to do so this morning. Spiritual gifts, as believers have them. We'll, talk, we'll break this down in the entire series. Next one is heart. How has God formed your heart? There's some things your heart cries about. There's other things your heart doesn't. Abilities. Some of you have abilities in uh, ABC. Some of you have abilities in XYZ. Some of you can do art. Some of you can do music. Some of you can build things. Personality. How many of you married somebody that has a personality? They got a personality, right? Uh-huh. And then experiences. Experiences. So the acronym is very simple. It's SHAPE. But there's benefits like crazy to understanding your spiritual gifts, your heart, your abilities, your personality, and your experience. Because that's what makes you. You. Right there. It explains you. It explains how you respond to authority. Criticism. How you like to be fed, how you like to be led, how you like to lead. When you can understand your shape, it reduces stress because you quit comparing yourself to other people, hopefully, and stop trying to do what you're not gifted at. One time I wrote a blog article. How many remember blogs? Yeah, that was like 40 years ago, right? I wrote a blog article about 20 things I know I'll never be good at. You know how freeing it was to realize I don't have to be good at something some other pastor is just because I'm a pastor. I don't have to, I don't have to be Stephen Furtick and be able to write songs and shred on guitar to be able to be a quality pastor. Can you say Amen but I know I look just like him because I'm all buff and everything. So I wrote, I wrote the article, and one of my friends said, I wrote the article, 20 things I know I'll never be good at, and my friend said, hey, you want some more ideas? <laughs> yep, you got to have friends like that, right? But when you understand how you're shaped, and it increases success and significance. Quick show of hands, how many are over the age of 30? 30, 30. Okay, if you knew at age 15... At age 15, what you knew at 30 about yourself, would your years have been better between 15 and 30? Yeah. Not just what you knew about the world, or about finance, or about education. If at 15 you knew what you knew about your own spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experience, if you just knew that at 15, what you, like you know at 30 or that you know now, you'd be able to navigate the journey God has for you in such a better way, in a different way. So this whole series is built on two very simple, basic Bible truths. Basic. You already know them. I'm not trying to get you to know them. You probably believe them. I'm not trying to get you to believe them. I'm trying to get them in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, so they come out in our actions. Number one, I matter to God. I matter to God. Even if you're not a believer, this impacts you. 
The scripture says, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Some of you married people that are wonderfully complex, didn't you? Don't, don't say yes to that. The scripture says it's amazing to think about. When I think about myself and how you've made me, your workmanship is marvelous. I matter to God. Everybody matters to God, even if God doesn't matter to them. There may have been a time in your life where God didn't matter to you. There's never been a time in your life you didn't matter to God. I'm not asking you if you believe it. What would it look like if you lived that? What would it look like if you believed that when you looked in the mirror this morning? We all know that God doesn't create carbon copies. Even twins, identical twins, have differences. He only creates originals. And the original of a master artist is priceless. A copy, not so much. But an original is, is valuable. And why did God make you different from everybody else? Did he look at everyone else and say, they're all mistakes, I'm going to make you? No, there's no matching footprint. No one has your footprint, no one has your fingerprint, no one has your voice print. Why did he make you different from anyone else who's ever lived? Apparently, he wants you to be you. And he's pleased to make you, you. Everyone matters to God, even if God doesn't matter to them. You matter to God, no matter what you've done, how hard it's been, or how much success you've had and how easy it's been. You matter to God. The second truth this series is based on is this. I was shaped for a purpose. I was shaped, made, formed by God for a purpose. His hand shaped me and made me. God never acts without a purpose. I'm not sure about mosquitoes, but maybe he has one. Also not sure about cats, but I won't go there. But God never acts without a purpose, and that includes the creation of you. Yeah. Oh, pastor, I did the math. With my parents and, and, my, and my older siblings, I was a surprise. There are surprise parents, but with God, there's no surprise children. You are not a surprise to God. No. And you've never been unwanted by God, even if you have at times in your life been unwanted by your family. You're not here by accident. You were planned before birth, not randomly generated. The Bible would declare you are purposely, personally, and orderly planned and designed by God, and God wanted you to be you because he wanted you to be you. And your uniqueness is what he wants you to offer to the world. There's things you are good at. There's things, ways that he has shaped, shaped and crafted you that he wants to be able to utilize and pull out of you that he can't pull out of anybody else because he put it in you. Now, there may be other people that can do some of what you do, but no one else can do it for you. Only you. Only you can use what God's put in you. And when I stand, kneel before him at the end of everything, I don't want to hold my hands and go, oh, I forgot I had that. I should have given that to you. I should have let you do something with that. I was too embarrassed at what I was supposedly good at. I didn't think anybody would, and I want to destroy that. Because let me tell you about someone who did not believe these two truths, that they mattered to God and they were shaped for a purpose. And that's this guy. Yeah. There was a birthday party for Brenda Stentz tomorrow, or yesterday because she turned 70. I should have wore that shirt I had on the left, right? <laughs> Wish I still had it. That's someone who didn't believe that they mattered to God. And that's someone who didn't believe they were shaped for a purpose. And what happens when someone doesn't grasp that? When someone doesn't know they matter to God, and you do, when someone doesn't know they were shaped for a purpose, and you are, when they don't know, they raise somebody. Like my dad raised me because my dad didn't know. He mattered to God, and he was shaped for a purpose. That was, picture was taken two years before he passed away in 2014. Take 71 to Lodi, take Route 83, and go until you hit water. That's where you'll be. That's my cue. I'll keep talking. <laughs> what happens when you do grasp that you matter to God, that you're shaped for a purpose, 
you can raise your son to be someone who knows that he matters to God and he's shaped for a purpose even when life punches you in the gut. That picture was taken on the day of my dad's funeral. Same location. Sarah pointed out later, our feet are the same direction as the picture with my dad. That's kind of wild, huh? One other thing about your shape. Your shape is fixed. It's stable. It endures. It's pretty constant. It's fixed by God. Pastor, I've been saved. I'm a new person in Christ. Old things pass away. All things become new. And if you're shouting that defensively, you were probably shouting in defensive before you got saved. And you're still going to be shouting in defensive. And if you were quiet before you got saved, you're probably still quiet. If you were pulling pranks as a kid and getting in school suspension, you're probably being put in timeout in the nursing home. <laughs> you're in the wheelchair in the corner. We'll talk more about that later in the series, but look at the life of Paul, the Apostle Paul. He's zealous. He's enthusiastic. He has a very sharp mind. Then he got saved, and he's still zealous. He's still enthusiastic. He still has a very sharp mind. He didn't change his shape. He changed how he used it. Your shape is how you are. How you use it is your character. You get to choose how you're going to use it. They got a bad personality. No, they got a strong personality. They may use it poorly, or they may use it well. You matter to God. You were shaped for a purpose. So let's hit the first one today, spiritual gifts. That's what believers have, spiritual gifts. When you give your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in. Uh, you're sealed for salvation. When the Holy Spirit comes in, you, you know you're, you're with Christ. But Scripture says we receive spiritual gifts. So we're not talking about supernatural spiritual gifts at this time. We're not talking about the baptism and the Holy Spirit. We're talking about a spiritual gift that God gives us to use for his purpose. There's at least 20 of them listed in Scripture. I want to read one of those lists. It's in Romans chapter 12. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. A man's gift is, and then the apostle starts listing some out, prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. He could go on forever. The list is probably not exhaustive, but exemplary. It's examples. When you're serving God and you're doing it well, you enjoy what you're doing. So I have a simple two-question test I usually give people, and it's, uh, it's not foolproof, but it's pretty good. When they say, oh, I don't know, I'm not good at anything. What do you enjoy doing? Question number one. What do you enjoy doing, and what do other people think you're good at? I don't care what you think you're good at because you're biased and usually negatively biased. I'm not that good at it, I'm not that good at it, and you find out they're world class, right? You're demonstrating your giftedness when you do something you're good at, and you do something that other people think you're good at, and that you enjoy doing. And you know what happens when you can find a spot in the local church when you're doing something you enjoy doing and you're good at? Nobody has to motivate you. You're already self-motivated to do it. And that's the best spot for someone to serve. It's different from a natural ability. Everyone has natural abilities. Only believers have spiritual gifts. I mean, physical abilities come to those who are physically born so we can survive. Uh, spiritual abilities come to those who are spiritually born so we can thrive. It is plural. Most people probably have more than one or two of these spiritual, spiritual gifts where they can serve God with, but this guy didn't think he had any. Didn't think he had any. And that's the goober with the microphone on his head talking to you right now. God invested something in me? That changed my life, literally. And I'm believing that today's message can at least be the spark. Spark. Spark arthritis. <laughs> that can start that change in you. And that change started in me at 18. Maybe it starts in you at 28. So if it's true that I have received spiritual gifts, the truth I'd like you to write down is, I am gifted here. On the count of three, can I ask you to say that out loud with me? One, two, three. I am gifted here. Again, I am gifted here. No matter what your parents said, no matter what your dad said, no matter what your siblings said, no matter what your boss or your ex said, and no matter what you say, you receive spiritual gifts and you are gifted here. You are gifted. If they put you in the back of the class, in the small room for those that needed extra help, 
And you definitely weren't in the gifted class. If you're saved, you're in the gifted class. That was the room I was never invited to. What does God want me to do with my gift? We should discuss, I should discover my gifts. The grammar in there is wrong. Abby's good at grammar. I gave her bad notes. I should discover my gifts. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant, don't want you to be unaware, don't want you to not, not be aware of them. One way we can discover them is by examination. We examine ourselves. If you go through on-ramp, there's a small little gifts inventory. Every believer in the room is called to serve the cause of Christ. There's not one of us that are exempt from serving. As we age, we may exempt out of some situations because of physical limitations, but every Christian is called to serve the cause of Christ, but your spiritual gift shows you how. So we do it by examination and by experimentation. You try things. How many of you have ever tried out for a worship team? Don't, don't raise your hand. Tried out for a worship team and realized that your ministry was somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And you put the worship leader in a really tough spot to say, hey, how do you feel about technology and pushing buttons? You can be part of worship that way. And that's why they're in the, in the sec tech booth right now. No. I'm assuming some of them can sing just fine. experiment. Where has God blessed you? Where have people been impacted when you serve in that way? Where have you seen results? It's a whole lot easier to discover your gift by trying ministry than discover your ministry just by sitting there and praying about it. Experimentation is necessary. And if experimentation is necessary, failure is not optional. It's necessary. Let me say it again. Failure is not optional. It's necessary. If you've never tried something in ministry and realized, whoa, that's not me, you're playing it too safe. Think, I, caught, I thought of this yesterday when I was just thinking this message over in my heart. The apostles, the original 12. Okay, Jesus wants me to follow him. All right, I'll follow you. I, I can be a teacher. How much teaching did the apostles actually do? What do we see them doing? Hey, go into town and find a man bearing a pitcher of water and set, up, set things up for that. Hey, go, go get things set up. I'm going to talk to a lot of people there. Hey, go ahead and do this. Did he get gopher boys? What did he do? John chapter 9. I think it's John chapter 9. They were called to be with him. And they were with him. What did they do? Lots of things. Hey, pass this, pass this bread out. Hey, bring the leftovers in. Hey, count them up. Hey, get in the boat and go across. They did lots of different things experimentation is going to be necessary. Because some of you may go, Pastor, I tried that ministry. It didn't work well. They put me in the nursery. That child is still recovering. <laughs> Notice in this passage the word different. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works in all of them and all men. This explains why people that love Jesus, people that are committed to his word, can see things differently. So I want to share an illustration with you. And as I go through it, I'm going to list seven different spiritual gifts. I'm going to ask you as I'm going through them to see which one fits you in your mind. Do you think, I would be that one? And as I'm going through them, I want you to guess which one fits me. So the example is this. We're serving a meal, and I dropped your dessert on the floor. I know some of you have already, thought, unforgivable sin, Pastor. Was it dark chocolate? Unforgivable sin. Mm -hmm. So let's say your gift is mercy. If it is, you might say, don't feel bad. It could have happened to anyone. Is that you? Maybe. Let's say your gift is preaching. That's what happens when you're not careful. Is that you? Let's say your gift is serving. There we go, serving. Let me help you clean it up. Let's say your gift is teaching. The reason it fell, it was too heavy on one side. Let's say your gift is exhortation. Hey, next time, let's serve dessert with a meal. Let's say your gift is giving. I'll be happy to buy you a new dessert. Let's say your gift is administration. Jim, get them out. Sue, pick it up. Mary, help me fix another dessert. Ready, go. On the count of three, tell me which one you think you are. One, two, three. On the count of three, tell me which one you think I am. One, two, three. No one's just one of those things. 
But there's definitely some of those you are not, right? Like, I would never do that. And there's some of those things you're like, I would totally do that. Because same God, different gifts. Same God works in different ways through different people. Same God. So which one of those is necessary? Which one can we do without? Which means we can't do without you. We can't. And if you withhold, we're hindered. Yeah, that should have been in the notes, right? If you withhold, we're hindered. What did I think my gifting was? Nothing. What do I want for you? An internal awareness of your value to the body of Christ. Because we're gifted, you can say, I am valued here. Can we say that together on three? One, two, three. I am valued here. One, two, three, one more time. I am valued here. And you are. If you don't feel that you are, I need to do a better job. That's exactly what I'm trying to lean that way. Last one. I think it's the last one about gifts. I should use my gifts. And the church, local church is a great place. It's not the only place. But it's a great place to discover, develop, and use your gifts. A healthy church, everyone's going to have what we'd call a Sunday serve. And in some way, shape, or form, about once a month at least, you're serving the body on Sunday. Can you think through how many people are serving to make today, this morning, happen? I mean, would you want to? Some of you walked in with a guest today. Would you want to go to that front door and find nobody there? I mean, we can make a drone to hand out bulletins, right? We could just put it on a stand where the sign says, get your own! We could do that. And if we were a business trying to make money and cut back labor, we probably could, like other businesses, right? Yeah. We could put a self-serve kiosk in there where you had to drop your money in to get your, your caffeine or whatever, whatever you grab out of there. We could easily do that. We could just build some boxes that you could drop your kids off in, and then you can punch the code in, and they stay in that box until you come back to get them in an hour, right? <laughs> we could do that. We've got a transformation team that can build boxes just fine. And we could easily play a video of a better preacher than the one you're listening to right now. We could do that. But we probably couldn't find a video of a better worship team, could we? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Mm hmm, mm hmm. What's your Sunday serve? I mean, Oprah's plan is pretty good. Everybody gets a free car! God's plan is better. Everyone gets a spiritual gift. Everyone can contribute. Everyone is important, literally, not figuratively, not, oh yeah, they're important because everyone's important. That's like a participation trophy, right? Hey, I got a participation trophy. What that means is you sat on the bench. That's what that means. You sat on the bench. You never got to play. Can I tell you, church is the only place a participation trophy matters. A presentation trophy that you're present is worthless. Don't just be present in the body. Participate. I don't know how. That's on me. If you don't know how, that's on me. Have you ever heard of something called the New People Party? How many of you have heard of the New People Party? You've heard of it. Okay, okay. Doing good. How many of you have heard of something called on ramp? How many of you are sick of hearing of those things? Some of you are. You're right. I'm not saying them for you. I'm saying them for the people that you're burdened for and you're inviting. Yeah. Some of you are sick of filling out connection cards. I haven't moved in 100 years, and I'm not going to move until they put me in a box. Keep filling the card out. Because a visitor behind you is going, do people really fill that stupid card out here? I guess they do. Okay. And that's how we get a chance for Sarah to call on that. We can just say, hey, we care about you. Any questions about the church? And try and shepherd them. Every person can partner in this kingdom. And then nobody has to walk out of here feeling insignificant. Personally, my participation started as the third guitar in our church orchestra of six instruments. <laughs> yep. Then church custodian. And then assistant to the assistant youth leader. And then preschool teacher. And then college Sunday school teacher teaching my peers at Bible college that happened to be coming to the same church I was at. That was intimidating at times. 
Many know their gifts, but they don't use them. A couple quick scriptures. Do not neglect your gift. I'm busy. Do not neglect your gift. I've got the wrong priorities. Do not neglect your gift. I might fail. Do not neglect your gift. I might be embarrassed if I tell people what I'm good at. Do not neglect your gift. Fan into flame the gift God gave you. Well, I don't know that it's all that good. Then let me be the hot air on your gift. Because <gasps> our church is hindered when you hold back, which means the people you're sitting around are hindered if you're holding back. And the people, that, some that you care about and love, and some that you see that are broken, are hindered when you hold your gift back. Besides, your gifts show your worth, that you're necessary, that you're needed. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. You're needed. Here's a challenge. Can you say, I'm needed? One, two, three. I'm needed. And you actually are here. God designed us to make a unique contribution to the body. Each of us should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. The long passage in Ephesians, I don't know the chapter and verse, but I know it's in the top right of my paper Bible. I know that. The, uh, when pastors prepare God's people for works of service, the body of Christ is built up, and we all hold together. We step forward in unity, no one being tossed about by wind and waves and getting blown all over the place. So when storms come, we can hold together, we can grow, and we can stand against opposition when we build each other up in love as each part does its work. That is a very loose translation. But that means we need each part to do its work. Those who are mouths <laughs> have to be the mouth. Those who are elbows need to be elbows. I don't know what part he's made you to play. Don't be a gallbladder. We don't know what's supposed to do with a gallbladder. And don't be tonsils. And don't be spleen. It's just a weird word, spleen. Don't be a spleen. We don't even know. Some people know what a spleen does. Doug Raver knows what a spleen does, but no one else. Yeah. We should use our gifts. Before the kingdom of God, before salvation, sometimes I heard, you're welcome here. Not necessarily church, maybe it's a ball team. Maybe it's the cafeteria table. You're welcome here. Once in a while, I may hear, you belong here. But it was in the church I heard that you are needed here. There may be places in your life that people have expressed, hey, you're welcome here. Other places where you can belong here. Where else are you being told, I am needed here? Can we say that on three? One, two, three. I am needed here. And you are. And what we're talking about is of vital importance. It's required of those who have been given a trust or a gift to prove themselves faithful. You don't have to prove yourself successful in the world's eyes. You don't have to be the best in the world at it, but you do have to be faithful with it. You're not accountable for gifts he didn't give you. I don't need to compare myself to Stephen Furtick or Craig Rochelle or other pastors that male pastors have men crushes on, and yes, male pastors have men crushes. Absolutely true. I'm not accountable for, for gifts he didn't give me, but I am accountable for gifts he did give me. Friend, you are accountable before God for the gifts he's given you. Hide it under a bushel. No. No. God has made an investment in you, and it is a sin to waste it. That's strong. That's harsh. Hopefully I've built up enough rapport earlier in the message, but God has invested in you. It would be a sin to waste it. So let me prepare you for a test. How many of you love surprise tests? Me neither. Question number one, what did you do with Jesus? Question number two, what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with what I gave you? Friends, death is the wrong thing to fear. Jesus has conquered death. Fear a wasted life. He hasn't conquered a wasted life, but he has shaped you and gifted you to avoid a wasted life. So what happens if you do what you can do? What you can. Not what you can't. How many of you can see about 20 things around the church you're going, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that. How many of you could come up here and play, play electric guitar like Will? Can I see your hands? 
because we're outing you right now, and we're going to get you on the worship team. Mm -hmm. Almost no hands, right? I can't do that. But there's some things you can do. Salvation is the greatest gift. But he's gifted you in other ways. We want to use that. At this time, we're going to end the message totally practically. Everyone, please pull your connection cards out. Everyone, please pull your connection cards out. We tried really hard for our FIT team to make sure everyone got a connection card today. We're going to ask you to fill out the A, B, C, D, E on the bottom right, asking everyone to pull the connection card out. If you got in without one, you must be a ninja. Or you're just grumpy, said, I don't want one of them cards. And that's okay, no big deal. But I want to encourage you to, to respond to something here. And then we're going to end with an uh, upbeat offertory and, and shout out some praise to God before we exit. All right, get your connection card. If you've got to see a little pen for your front row, get a pen, get a pen. If you currently serve on a Sunday team, circle A, where it says A, B, C, D, E. If you currently serve on some form of a Sunday team, circle A. If you want or need a Sunday team to serve on, circle B. And you can circle as many as fit you. If you used to serve on some sort of Sunday team, circle C. If you honestly would say, I don't know where I would fit, circle D. And if you believe the Browns will win the Super Bowl, circle E. That's also known as the gift of faith. Supernatural faith. When you tell God yes, it's amazing what he can do. Let's not waste what he's poured into us. Stand with me, would you?